Twas a night in the Berkshires, a housewife's affair. With drama and antics swirling the air, Bethany and Luann, their feud took the stage. In Dorinda's manner, they unleashed their rage. Luann, the countess in her royal flair, claimed a role in Skinny Girl, but did Bethany care? Luann, you're a slut, Bethany flung with no cheer. Happy holidays indeed in the Berkshires this year. I all day! I decorated! I did it nice! Hello and welcome to a very special Christmas episode of Bravo Outsider. I'm your host, Craig Midwinter, and I'm very excited to be joined by Sandy Kloak and Sean O'Rourke. Welcome back, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. We've got a super fun show planned today. We're going to cover an iconic set of Real Housewives of New York episodes. But before we venture off to the Berkshires, Sheena and Lala from Vanderpump Rules dropped a brand new Christmas song, Christmas Slay, and I think we need to discuss it. Uh, Sean, as our outsider and someone with impeccable music taste, I want to start with you. Are are you familiar with any Bravo music? What did what did you think about this one? Um, I'm familiar with some, like on display from oh, okay, um, yeah. one of the New Jersey ones. I remember from many years ago. Um, maybe other ones here and there. I think uh, Tom has a band, right, from Vanderpump. Yeah, one yeah, of the Toms. Charles McMansion. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Great. On on display is a, an interesting one to pick out. I, I that's a little bit of a, a deep cut. I feel like, but Melissa Gorga's well, music is like more catchy than it has any right to be. I've had a uh, part of on display like pop up in my head for the last twelve or thirteen years, just randomly, <laughs> um, and I can't tell you why. But I don't know for the the Sheena and Lala one. It's I think it's like it's for other people to enjoy. <laughs> you um, weren't uh, you weren't feeling it yeah not not entirely um i don't know it's like i'll find nice things to say about it it's it's a produced piece of music that's great <laughs> um yeah not a, not entirely for me uh particularly and I, I can't tell who's doing what part but like the very uh training wheels on rap at the end of the song oh yeah <laughs> is maybe maybe a low light there <laughs> but you know i don't want to like demean anybody doing their best to make it art too much so good for them yeah i don't know about like making an art maybe making a buck is probably more what they were going for but <laughs> that's the thing like it's i don't think it can stand on its own as like a, a piece of music or a piece of art it's very clearly part of like a vertical yeah. And I, I don't think that there's any intention for it to stand alone because this entire song was like fan service to me. Like there's one reference after another. They talk about like Erica Jane and the like the earrings. We got the Trey's Amigas on Orange County. It was very, very directed at Bravo fans, which I can kind of respect. But also at the same time, like Lala has tried to make a serious attempt at music and so has mm. has sheena so like this is the first one that kind of stands out to me as being like really focused on bravo fans as an audience and um i don't know i thought it was super catchy but i also again it's it's something that only really has a place for fans what did you think sandy yeah i agree and it's a little sad to see them moving from legitimate but yet delusional career aspirations to something that actually does make sense for them to create as a product, as you're saying. And as I've said before, I, I love a delusional like singing career storyline on these shows. So it's a little sad to see them actually maybe make something that, yeah, really does have, have an audience and have a, have a consumer, but yeah, I found it catchy. I might, I don't know that I'd put it on again, but like I might. <laughs> Would you put it on before a Countess Luann track? Well, I was going to say, because I also, you know, getting in the holiday spirit was watching Luann's Christmas uh, music video and having a video just, of course, adds so much. So I don't know if they'll get to that, yeah. but her All I Want for Christmas is You or whatever it's called is so amazing. Like just the awkwardness. Oh, you think that one's the, better? It's not comparable. It's oh. a whole other genre. <laughs> And it, it's what I want from these. You don't agree, Craig? Like, I feel like it's so awkward. It's the, like, I love it. 
I, I I'm uh, with Sandy there because like the Sheena Lala song is sort of bad to me in a way that like um like sort of like a blockbuster hero movie that I don't enjoy is like I just don't want to watch it. But the Countess Luann one is more like seeing like the room or something. You are tearing me apart, Lisa. Like you can kind of revel yeah. in its yeah. <laughs> exactly. its baffling exactly. failures. Exactly. I feel like. Okay, so Countess Luann, I think, in terms of her music, is it's one that I think leans more into the fan service side of things than pretty much anyone else that I can think of in the, in the Bravo sphere. All of her songs are like referential, like Feeling Giovanni, uh, Money Can't Buy You Class, like they all are tied in with some sort of storyline that she's got going on or some sort of quote. Um, so I felt like you know, this song from Sheena and Lala was very similar in that way. It doesn't compare to something like, you know, other songs from even Lala and Sheena, like Lala's uh, song Boy with James Kennedy is so good. Like that stands on its own as a certified banger, in my opinion. But like, um, and, you know, Good as Gold is like, Sheena was really, really trying to do something. And like, leverage this platform that she got to like catapult herself to another level. And, you know, it's so honest. And so I think that this collab between Sheena and Lala is uh, way closer to anything that Luann has done through her career as a musician than it is to anything that they have done previously. But yeah, I I don't know. Um, I don't agree. Maybe. Yeah. (laughs) There's a level, there's an interesting, um, and perfect um, combination with Luann of like a, a level of awareness of what her fans want with her cabaret show and hamming it up. And, but there's this ambiguous like level of still delusion that she's like a good singer that's like baked into that, that makes it so perfect. Whereas like this one was auto tuned or whatever you call it. It's like robot voices, right? Like, I don't know if, is, I guess Lala's a good singer, but Sheena's not. And I couldn't tell them apart, right? Like you can't, Yeah. it's, it's generic. Like, like Sean was saying, it's, it's for, it's to an extent, it's for Bravo fans, but it's also for the masses. Cause it could also, it's just a catchy, like throwaway song. And like, like Luann's is not going to be listened to by the masses. I totally agree. It's goofy and it's ham, it's hammed up. It's, sort of campy and she's she leans into that but yeah she's in this sort of weird middle ground of doing that and not and just I think a lack of I don't think she's super self-aware either like I don't know I think that's really fascinating and that's why I really like it and I would compare hers more to like uh, Ashley Darby's coffee and love or whatever where it's like Mm, yeah I don't know I don't know if that's fair I don't know enough about Ashley's connection to music obviously Luann's more committed to this (laughs) career but yeah, I mean, Coffee and Love is such a, uh, a a standout hit. Um, that's high praise to be compared to, to Coffee and Love, in my opinion. One of my favorite Bravo songs. Um, I, I think that Ash, Ashley's motivations were, like, clearly not serious. Like, it was a very unserious thing for her to do. And yeah. I think you're right in terms of, like, Luann, for the most part. Her music is also very unserious, but... Um, yeah, that ambiguity that you've got from Luann's like, um, lack of self-awareness or the, you know, it's hard to tell how aware she is at any point really adds to the mystique of it all. Whereas, yeah, you're, you're right. There's no hiding how self-aware they are when they are doing this this song christmas sleigh which i think is i don't know it's it's yeah it's still fun to me i think that there are some like it's catchier on a whole than a lot of other bravo songs like i feel like there was more effort put into the um you know, the, the composition of it all and making sure that it's got like a nice hook and Mm -hmm. that much I, I love. And I think that there's some standout lines, but also I am a little off put by how, you know, in your face it is for, for the fandom. So 
Um, what what standout lyrics were there for you guys from this one? Um, there's a bit about being Santa's thoughty or something in there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, Santa's little thoughty. That's probably the most ear catching for me. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it was yeah. rhyming something with Lisa Rena. Which yeah. is not how you say her last name. I don't remember what the rhyme was, but it wasn't even close. And of course, the Rachel me, uh, dig, Blah. whatever. The Rachel dig was so unnecessary, and uh. they just opened themselves up to criticism on that because I don't know the the fact that there's seems to be some duplicitedness uh, on the part of at least Sheena in terms of her, you know oscillating between being on Ariana's side and Tom Sandoval's side and in this upcoming season and all the speculations surrounding that, um, the Mm -hmm. fact that they just throw that in there, like why, what does, what does that help? And you're now you're trying to like make a buck on, on her name. I, yeah, not into that at all. I think Uh, there should be more diss tracks in Bravo. Yeah, (laughs) Mm. it really should be. Yeah. Uh, the line is, it's the Tres Amigas sipping tequila's lip service to Santa like Lisa Rina's, which is pretty good. I uh, they they forced it, and that kind of makes it a, a little yeah. bit better. <laughs> sure, yeah. The whole it, a lot of it feels like if like a drama teacher is trying to do a cool rap mm-hmm. to connect with some students, like it very much has that energy and flow to it. Yeah, totally. So yeah, safe to say that. I've got a complicated relationship with the song and it's only been out for a few days now. Um, (laughs) Do you guys have any other thoughts on this before we move into the body of what we want to cover? No, just Luann's Christmas song forever. That's all I have to say. I I put that song out of my mind almost immediately. (laughs) It's in my, it's stuck in my head today. (laughs) It's pretty bad. (laughs) Oh, Luann's, Luann's song. I is also like from the cursed season of, Real Housewives yeah, of New York. Like, that was the last season for that cast. And there's kind of a stink on it for for me. That's fair. And that's why it was so nice to travel back as a segue to the Berkshires or however you pronounce that to the ultimate, most wonderful cast other than having Tinsley there and just remembering the golden days of Roni because this was absolutely my favorite show. And like, it's good now again with the new cast, but it's different and yeah. just so nostalgic. And I was like coming home, I'm like statement necklaces and just all these things that I, <laughs> you know, don't have in my life anymore. And it was so lovely. Christmas yeah, is it was <laughs> so refreshing. And Sandy, you were on earlier this season when we picked another episode from this season. Um, it was yeah. like this. The, it was right before. We got right. I think it was like two episodes before, okay. maybe it yeah. was with, we got clips of it, it with yeah. the drunken Ray yes. uh, yeah. at Dorinda's party or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It, oh, it what was they, the one they flash back to. <laughs> yeah. Sick. Yeah. Um, it was really refreshing. Sean, have you seen anything from this season before? No, this I'm trying to, I was trying to, put it in the timeline this would be like 2015 16 or so yeah i think about 2016 it aired i looked it up okay so a few years after i had like stopped watching most or had like a a long time off i should say for bravo shows so Um, so who did you recognize from this then uh oh some of my very best friends countess luann bethany uh ramona um I don't remember. I'm sure Sonia was on some of the stuff I watched, but I don't remember specifically. But like definitely oh. Luann and Bethany and and uh, the singer all stand out. Okay, amazing. So we're going to do a little segment called Housewives in a Hurry. We're going to give you 20 seconds. I want you to just brain dump everything that stands out to you from these episodes that we watched. You've only got 20 seconds, so try to fit in as much as you can. And your time is okay. going to start right now okay um dorinda has weird obsession with christmas decorations uh, including i think a santa mannequin in the background of one episode mm-hmm. uh luann and bethany having a a, a ray Liotta, joe pesci uh, how am i funny <laughs> argument that is a through line through all three um she's asian and oh damn <laughs> it's it's not a lot of time but you got you got a good amount uh did you have more that you want to want to get out there 
Uh, well, just I was like really thrown by all the references to Jules' uh, Asian pride, I guess. Um, <laughs> sp- uh, oh, nobody could spell pedophile. That's the other thing. Yes. <laughs> uh, amazing. Let's uh, let's get into a, a little segment called What's Weird. And I want to go around and identify one thing that stood out to you as just being like it's from another planet we'll start with you sean uh from all three like yeah from all three from all three episodes one one single thing um the one single thing would be the line it's very asian of you to bring games which i think (laughs) carol might say to jules at some point (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's just like um like i think something else is happening and they're busting out board games and like i don't know what that means <laughs> yeah, I, I I had that marked down as well, and I was like, "Oh, is that like an an Asian stereotype? Am I like just not up on my Asian stereotypes?" <laughs> that, that... I feel like it's like a German thing more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Sandy, how about you? Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit like I don't know, a little broad on this one, but I was actually really struck by just the eerie and dreamlike uh aimless limbo sense i was getting from this berkshire's house after this fight i was like kind of creeped out it was like unnerving supernatural intangible they were like wandering around in these hallways after this fight some people were in sequins some people were in pajamas some people were playing pool some people were <laughs> watching Law and order. Some people were buying gifts online at a Christmas party. People just sort of wandering, sending <laughs> texts to each other, then seeing each other, but kind of passing as if they were both ghosts in other parallel dimensions. And I was trying to figure out what is this like draw, you know, calling to what is, what is this feeling that I'm like, what in pop culture did this connect to for me? And what I came up with was the Christmas Eve episode of X files where Scully and Mulder are in this, mansion haunted by two ghosts. It was the night before Christmas in a house full of ghosts. Mulder, Scully, and their special guest hosts. Ed Asner and Lily Tomlin would show them the way. But the doors are all locked, and they're here to stay. <coughs> the X-Files, an all-new Christmas episode, Sunday at 9, 8 central on Fox. They get separated, and there's these op- the ghosts are creating hallucinations, and they just kind of wander around and finally make themselves their way out of this maze, this supernatural, creepy, weird, otherworldly place. So that is maybe way too complex of an answer for this new segment, but <laughs> I thought that was weird. No, that's amazing. I love the <laughs> like tying it to ghosts because like ghosts have a common like ghosts are Christmassy thing, right? Everything goes away at Halloween except for ghosts. Ghosts stick around and, you know, obviously the Christmas carols like the biggest example of this, but you're right. It is like disorienting almost to get a sense of like what is going on and there's just people wandering through and these housewives haunting the bluestone manor that's that's really amazing it's like the I, I love that <laughs> yes that's yeah. like i was interested in if you guys had any other ones because that's a good one too like what what is this call upon in like pop culture and film history like because i feel like it's significant this sort of i don't know it was a vi- it was a feeling that felt familiar and I was very interested in that. <laughs> I love it. I, I, and I have no doubt that they will continue to haunt that place far after they've all passed. <laughs> Along with the ghost of Richard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the thing that I identified as weird, just a tiny little thing, but when we get the sh- like the shots, and this was shown a few times of Dorinda making making it nice and like setting everything up, she goes into each bedroom and on the nightstand she places like a Pez thing, like a Pez dispenser, <laughs> and like there's like a completely like wrapped and packaged. Pez dispenser that she's like going and putting on every night scent, which I have never caught in all my previous watchings of these episodes before <laughs> until I was like taking notes and looking for things. But yeah, she's putting Pez dispensers on every one's nightstand. And I don't know, just really quirky thing that I wanted to call out. I think that's that is cute. like, it is, but it's definitely not like something I would want as a guest, but it's certainly, <laughs> I would appreciate its weirdness for sure. You wouldn't want a Pez? 
It'd be cool no, if those, those are just... piss dispensers of the housewives. Oh. <gasps> that would be cool. Now that would be amazing. That would oh, be 100% yeah. wonderful. Yes. Instead okay. of like the monogram <laughs> bullshit that you usually get on yeah. one of these trips. Like yeah. a big wine glass. Yeah. Could you get, can you get custom Pez? Is that a thing? I don't. That would be so I don't cool. know. I feel mm-hmm. like probably not. The amount of effort that would need to go into actually like, like sculpting or modeling 3D printer. a can you, can you make me yeah, one? you can just Craig? pirate it. <laughs> yeah, but you still need like a human in the loop in order to like create it in a way that is suitable for manufacturing. I think I'm not a manufacturing expert, mm. but it feels like something that you would still need to involve a, a human in. But if you work for Pez, let us know in the comments. That would really help us out. <laughs> it's a good time to say if you are watching us on YouTube, hit like and subscribe. Uh, if you're listening on Spotify or your platform of choice, make sure that you uh, leave a rating and a review and uh, find us on YouTube because we do from time to time post video essays and stuff that don't get released on our podcast feed. So be sure to check out our most recent one, which is what if Teresa Judice exploded in the Challenger disaster, <laughs> a fun little alternate <laughs> history uh, story there. So uh, if you like Cold War allegory and Real Housewives of New Jersey, like the 80 people who have watched this video, well, then this <laughs> is uh, this is for you. <laughs> um, I want to move into highlights now. Um, since we're covering three episodes, um, you can do anywhere between like two to six highlights. Uh, I know that there's a ton that went on here. So we'll start with you, Sean. What uh, what were your highlights? Um, so yeah, the main one is just the through line of the three episodes is the Luann and Bethany argument is like such a nice piece of drama. Um, I feel like you got to give credit to Luann for like being willing to throw down, but is really outclassed by Bethany in an argument. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's the second of the three episodes like Bethany's throwing heaters. She brings up gray gardens when she's like tearing into Luann <laughs> living with Sonia. And I think the best Luad can come up with is like um, something about like put that in your cookie jar. Um, yeah, like that <laughs> held my interest throughout all three, like really good high drama. Love it. Yeah. So I've got a, a little bit of a question here. You've said that you think that Bethany w- came out on top and I feel like there's like no question about that. Um, but Dorinda says, you know, kind of, her excuse for not inviting Sonia is, you know, cause she wants to protect her. Um, and then afterwards she even says like, it, tell Sonia it was a good idea that she didn't come. Cause Bethany was, would have torn her to threads. What do you guys think? Would Sonia have made this trip better or worse? I felt so bad for Sonia. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Like when the scene, when she like gets told she can't come is quite heartbreaking, but I don't, what's the, What's the context there? Like Sonia and Bethany are arguing over Sonia's drink line or something. Yeah. So Sonia is, so Bethany owns uh, skinny girl or that was mm-hmm. her like brand. Um, Sonia this season has decided that she's going to start her own drink line called tipsy girl. And it just like set Bethany off and she was so pissed. There's an episode, a few episodes back, the same episode as the one with like, the drunken Ray uh, conversation, which is a fantastic episode yeah. where uh, I have Bethany, a charity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it that helps guy. poor people. <laughs> <laughs> Luann's lover. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Bethany invites her up to the skinny girl office or whatever. And basically like tears her apart and tells her just how awful of a person she is. And, so Dorinda has decided not to invite Sonia and she's saying that it's because she wants to protect Sonia from the wrath of Bethany, which I think watching this episode was probably a good idea. I don't know. That's entirely the motivation for um, it. I don't think it was like purely to protect Sonia. I think it was also to be, you know, continue to be in Bethany's good graces, but I feel like Bethany would have actually low key wanted Sonia to be there so that, instead of lashing out at Luann as a proxy for Sonia, she could just do it directly. Well, she sure didn't seem happy to see Sonia at the party. Yeah. Yeah. She was not happy to see Sonia mm-hmm. at the party. So I don't know about that, but I think Sonia should have been there. That's the cast. 
Sonia's iconic and she could only add more chaos and that's only ever good. So it depends how we're yeah, judging it this. Yeah, would have been more entertaining. But yeah, <laughs> for me, yeah, she should have been. And, and Luann needed more people like on her side or just not against her. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. Just needed more neutral or chaos agents in the mix, I think. Yeah, so if you could sub out one person with Sonia, who would it have been? If we sub out Carol, what happens to Bethany? That's what I would do. But which mm, Bethany just leave then? Like, like then that. that's no fun. But, you know, they're little, they're little like bestie clique people. So that changes the dynamic. Yeah. But, but I don't know. Maybe then Bethany just wouldn't have come or something lame. That is, that is really interesting. We would lose out on the dynamic between Luann and Carol, which I feel like that is like a more volatile. There's like, yeah, There's that's important. More history there than there is between Bethany and Luann. Like, yeah. Bethany was just all pent out, pent up on like Sonia needed to like attack Luann. But um, yeah, no, I I feel like that would be a really interesting substitution. My my gut would say like pull Jules because she yeah. didn't really bring a whole lot, no, she but didn't. she did have one of my favorite moments and. Um, this is going to be one of my highlights, uh, but the scene where she's out there on the phone, you know, uh, with her dad who's sick and has pneumonia. And then Luann comes out and is like, just <laughs> not listening to anything that Jules says and just talking about how like she was called a slut when <laughs> Jules is like, I'm worried my dad is dying. She's like, Oh, Bethany just called me a slut. <laughs> Yeah, like she didn't even so say like funny. uh-huh. She didn't even say any <laughs> yeah. words that acknowledged she heard that she was with another person. Like and that yeah. is one of the most that is a very iconic Luann scene and so yeah, if she she needed to be like the whatever like other person in that scene then she it was worth it. But otherwise, yeah. Maybe she should have been with her dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, she had to bring the board games too though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh Sean, what other highlights did you have? Um, ooh, a, a low light is the, I think it's John is Dorinda's partner. Oh yeah. It makes his really like awkward joke about the phone being moist or wet <laughs> and it oh, yeah. just falls like so flat. Uh, and I think Dorinda shoots him a look and he has to do like a, uh, uh never mind. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, a, a cutaway to, uh, I think it's Jules who gives her list of words that women don't want to hear. Uh, moist ointment and grundle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that I have that as a low light, but it stood out quite a bit. Um, more importantly though, I want to bring up uh, Dorinda's cake that she has at the sleepover. Maybe oh, I'm wrong yeah, with yeah. this, but I, I feel like she presents the cake as like something her mom made her as like a, a tradition that they have. And then that's introduced somewhere in the second episode or the first episode. And then later on, it comes up multiple times that her mom like bought the cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it feels like a really weird, like thing to be so emotional over. Like my mom <laughs> paid for this cake and had it delivered. Um, <laughs> she even calls it sacred. She, she's like, yeah. yeah, this is sacred to me. This like and cake like, from the first time the it the comes up, store. she points out like, Oh, every year my mom, I don't know if she says makes, but it's heavily implied that like, this is something <laughs> her mom has done for her forever. and made her a cake. But it's like, it's like a sheet cake. You bought at the Berkshire's bakery or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's uh, going on there. Sandy, what, what were your highlights? Um, I was kind of interested in, in the jewels in her dad thing, because it kind of, it, it now, now that um, there's all this stuff out in more recent past about um, Leah being at some, I don't know if it was the Berkshires again or some Hamptons house when her grandma was yeah. dying. It, it kind of reminds me of that. And now Leah's like suing Bravo for all sorts of things. And, and that was in the news as one of the things like in this house, they're like reality reckoning where they're not treated well as employees that they were, she was like pressured to be there. But at the same time, I don't know. It sounds like Jules dad was fine. And more than once she says like, this is the best day of my life. So I found that kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I get, I get going to a weekend if like your parent is like ambiguously ill and you're kind of keeping tabs. But if you're like, I think he's going to die and this is the best weekend of my life. I forgot I had 
kids and like any kids, responsibilities. Yeah. Probably not comparable to Leah's situation, but I just found that kind of interesting. Um, and it was interesting yeah, to that, see. Oh, go ahead. No, I, uh, that's interesting because it like speaks to this like really fraught familial dynamic that she has. Like, uh, I know that her and her husband divorced sometime after this. And like, I think from the stinger that we got, we kind of see a little bit of tension. I don't remember that being like a really big through line on this season, but we got that clip where she's like pissed off at him. Cause he makes some sort of like gross comment on, um, wanting a hot nanny around or something like that. Um, but yeah, just like her being on both sides of the spectrum in terms of being like so concerned about her, her dad possibly dying and then her seeming so like, um, relieved of the burden of being a parent for like 24 hours and how like refreshed she is, um, that she says that this is like the best best day of my life or something like that is is so so funny and well not funny but like just uh remarkable yeah and it's not it's not unrelatable honestly like life is complicated you can feel many things i don't know (laughs) so yeah it's kind of interesting um it was interesting to see ramona act as a very obvious and awkward and ineffective like peacekeeper and mender of fences because i'm so used to sort of Ramona being horrible and like she got officially canceled for horrible things. And it kind of reminded me, I was like, I don't really remember. I guess she might've gotten progressively more horrible as time went on. And perhaps she was like encountering younger people with different values than her and like kind of feel like getting pushed out of the show because she seems like almost like a reasonable, like quirky and weird and annoying, but like not totally out, you know, out to lunch. So I found that interesting and, trying to remember what she was like before yeah this was the least annoying i've ever found yeah <laughs> ramona i think yeah and especially in the last episode i think when she's talking with luann at her party later she gives her like actually decent advice and the advice that she said that she gave to sonia seemed like it was decent advice and i was like shocked to see ramona being this um, functional. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, and, and selfless, frankly, because she was just like trying to help her friends kind of mend things. And, you know, Ramona's not one of those housewives that really played the game. Like she wasn't strategic. She just like operated by her own compass, which was, you know, always about putting Ramona first. And so to see this, yeah, I agree. It was completely uncharacteristic. She does Um, need to train her dog better though. Oh God. Yeah. Gross. (laughs) What happened to the dog? The dog disappeared after (laughs) sitting on the floor. (laughs) Taken away out back. (laughs) The housekeeper Uh, took care of it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Any other highlights, Andy? My last one was my runner up for what's weird which was a little moment when they were making breakfast. And I think it was Jules was pulling out a, a whisk or one of them was, and then Jules grabs one of those like head massager things. And she's like, he's like, Dorinda, this is a head massager. And Dorinda doesn't, she's kind of like, Oh, like she doesn't seem to acknowledge it. I'm like, I think Dorinda is using that head massager as a whisk. So that was kind of <laughs> cute. <laughs> as long as it's cleaned, I guess it's fine. <laughs> I didn't know. Well, I think she that. puts it on Dorinda's head and then like presumably back into a drawer or <laughs> utensil holder or something. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um yeah, I uh I don't know what to say like how to narrow it down in terms of highlights cuz this just has so much going on. I feel like um the the main things that stand out to me are the dynamics between the women that we get here, like the fight between Bethany and Luann. I think we are seeing Bethany at her, like at her best and maybe her most complex because like, I feel like she doesn't really have that much of a beef with Luann, but we are seeing so much going on that is partially related to Sonia, but also this season, I think her relationship with Jason was like at its most like toxic, their breakup. So um, 
this really felt like everyone's going to the Berkshires to, you know, blow off some steam and that's what this looks like for bethany is for her to just go on a complete (laughs) utter rampage it was beautiful to see it is so toxic and i mean everyone kind of hates bethany on social media now i don't care this is iconic housewife behavior i i love it and these episodes will never not be special to me because like it's just it's so it's so like it's pure toxicity and it's being motivated by so many complex factors and you know, it's nothing is really about what is happening on the surface and the words that are coming out of, out of her mouth. It's her like, you know, getting all this anger out on camera in a way that like, this is the, the best way that she can express herself. Like this is how she, um, she has more of a like uh, a vocabulary built around conflict than she does about like anything else. And so, yeah, I, I feel like this is like reality TV poetry. So Bethany is my number one highlight here. Um, But this is also like masterful work from Luann in a way that like, I think Luann doesn't always, um, you know, Luann isn't, necessarily a a fighter directly like she's got a way of just like you know blowing things off and like and she's in this enclosed space and she's like doing what she constantly does and sometimes she's backing down and like giving up ground but also like there are times where she's just like making it like oh it's no big deal like not really receiving what Bethany is putting down, which makes Bethany more pissed off. And I don't know, just it, it was like the perfect storm. And um, so those two are my, my number one highlight. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing that I love is when we get a little clock, like the timestamps on these shows and we see like when things start and how things are going, how much of, this iconic conflict happens in such a short period of time. Like I think, you know, it was over the course of like four or five hours that we got the bulk of these episodes. And that is just like so much reality TV gold (laughs) condensed there. Like I, I'm very curious if when they left and the cameras stopped rolling, whether like the cast realized how, like iconic they were or like the producers had to have known how like fruitful this was going to be, but it's, yeah, it, it's so fascinating. Totally. Yeah. I thought Luann held her own, like honestly had a lot of sympathy for Luann just genuinely, like she was really brutally attacked. And as much as I totally agree, this was amazing reality TV. There's still a part of, there's still one part of me that like, is not cool with like the really like nasty things that Bethany said to her, like as far as slut shaming, I understand her point when she was a hypocrite, but you know, there's a little part of me that's like, ugh. and Luann just like held like that's, that's harsh to take. And she like, she continued, she soldiered on and she remained, she remained Luann, like you said. And she did that yeah. outdoor scene with Jules that was like so beautiful. And it just, I really, I come out with Luann as like my, I don't know. Luann has my heart in this episode. Yeah. And I, I think one, one other thing that really stood out to me about this was how much like overhearing there was, there's just like such perfect timing, but between like, you know, someone is there in the midst of like talking shit and the other, that person just happens to walk in the room or mm-hmm. be just around the corner. It, it is so like perfectly choreographed. It's like, mm-hmm. This is ballet. This is. Yes. <laughs> it was, it was There's amazing. also a really great forced overhearing moment where Bethany goes to gossip about Luann by sitting closer to her on the yeah. other side of Ramona. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's like such a such a flex. Bethany's such a heel. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so, uh, question for you guys: Does Luann have? the same haircut as Bethany or does Bethany have the same haircut as Luann? 
It's pretty similar. Um, they have really different like neck and head shapes to me though. So you, I think feel like you could pull it off as different. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty close. Was that a brand new haircut for Bethany? That is unfortunate. And she does admit it. They obviously do yeah. look similar. It's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> that was wise of her if she wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same hair. It is. <laughs> it is. They both look good. Yeah. yeah no, they yeah, both look great. Proof. And you both have dark hair. There's only f- not that many options. I don't know. <laughs> but that, I'm glad that Luann had something on her because she needed something. Like she really yeah, needs yeah. something, right? <laughs> it is like. <laughs> Like the biggest nothing, but <laughs> it's something. Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because like Luann cannot, she cannot play the dozens with Bethany. Can't stand up to it. Yeah. So just to have something in your pocket. Okay. We're going to get into ratings right away here. Um, one second. Oh, I wanted okay. to bring up, there's one more weird thing. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Someone is buzzing me. Um, in there's a moment where Sonia, I guess, realizes she needs to get a gift for her daughter who's away at school. And there's the sequence of like gathering junk with yes. two children around her house. <laughs> like it looks like just a bunch of stuff that she's had, like from Amazon deliveries. She gives yeah, her like, like a phone a charger, charging snack board. bars. <laughs> and then there's yeah. a line, I think it's Caesar or something is her stylist. And Sonia's talking about, prison shows and the, it cuts to Caesar and he says, I actually really like those shows. They can be very creative. And then it cuts to one of the like 18 year old interns looking very awkward, very <laughs> choice moment. <laughs> There's that- some weird extras. I, Sonia has always had just a like weird rotating roster of interns. Um, but chaotic. also, also the, the party at the beginning of the first episode where the girl is like dressed as Elsa, the caviar server. <laughs> so funny. Like, <laughs> I don't know where they got this girl, but she just stands out so much. That was um, odd. Amazing. And no, no one got her new clothes after Bethany requested it either. But, uh, yeah, she just had yeah. to do that. But no, that's a great, that's a great point, uh, Sean. Cause like, so you so good that no matter what she's doing, we want to see her. And that's why it's like a shame that she wasn't there. But at least when we get a breakout, like her at home alone scene, it's still super good. And it's a nice break from the eerie chaos of the manor, right? Or whatever. So she's just so wonderful. And seeing those interns, God, to man, if I could have, like what I would give to reorganize my life to be able to be a Sonia Morgan intern for the like average span of like six weeks that they all work for her. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was beautiful. Imagine really the secrets love, uh, that they are taking to the grave. <laughs> I love like awkward side characters are my favorite thing about Bravo. Like if they have like, they go to an event and there's like a whiskey tasting guy or something who just looks like they don't want to be there. Yeah. Uh, and those two <laughs> interns are like really high level for that. Yes. yes. <laughs> you know what was the best of example of that was recently. It, I think it was, it was at the oh, oh, toothless, not, no, homeless, not homeless, toothless, not toothless dinner. Yeah. <laughs> See, no one can say it. No one can, on Bever- is it is it Beverly? This is Beverly Hills, right? Beverly Hills, yeah. And they but were it like, sounds like a charity that would be on Arrested Development. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like that Portia was, de Rossi's Doberman ears. <laughs> Iconic content. That was just last season. You should look it up. There's lots of clips, lots of reenactments. I think I'm right, right? I think it was that dinner, and they were like actually from the charity or maybe it was a different charity, but they were the absolute best, like normal people that you would just pan to. And they were just like, (laughs) because the the ladies were going off, like not even dissimilar to this kind of level. And they were just like, how do I get out of here? Oh my God. It was amazing. I love the idea of having like no context on these shows and like just not being prepared for the level of dysfunction that is going to be (laughs) be there for these crazy, uh, crazy scenes. <laughs> yeah, I think serving an event for those people would be so cool. So we're going to do things a little bit differently today in terms of how we do our housewives ratings. Uh, instead of going through each housewife and everyone giving them a rating out of 10, uh, we're all going to have an allocated a number amount of points that we are able to distribute to each of the housewives that we see fit. So 
we're just going to go around the table. Um, the first person is going to give points, any number of points, to a housewife of their choice. And then the rest of us have the opportunity to add more points. Sandy and I each have 23 points. Sean has 24 points that we can allocate. Uh, Sean, uh, who do you want to start with uh, in terms of assigning points? Um, we got to start with Bethany, I think. I got to throw 10 of them down on Bethany right away. All right. 10 points. Such on a Bethany. strong performance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I think that that is, you know, 10 points. I would throw another 10 down on, on Bethany of, of my points. I think it, it's pure poetry. What we're seeing it's ballet. It is just one of the best pieces of reality TV that I have ever seen. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give her another 10 points there. Um, that leaves 50 points up in the air between all of us. Uh, Sandy, do you want to assign any points to Bethany? I'm just doing she a lot of a- math right now in my head. <laughs> I'm very stressed. That, um, that's why we're trying this out on the on the Christmas <laughs> episode to work out the, the flaws. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to get, I mean, Bethany deserves some points for me here, but but I can't give her a whole 10. So yeah, I'm well, tr- so this is cumulative. So you could put another like 20 on Luann to even her, like even it up if you wanted. You'd have less points remaining to disperse over the la- the, the remainder of, of the women. Okay, I have a question about this, Craig. Yeah. Are we aiming to like have our person win or like have the most equitable division based on what we think about the show? <laughs> Um, I don't know what we're trying to do here, to be honest. We're <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. I'm thinking out loud. Okay. But okay. yeah, no, it's good. It's a work in progress. I'm going to, okay. But like, is it, is it like wrong of me to give Bethany points? Cause you guys have given her such absurd amounts of points already. Like, is that in, in good conscience? Can I even do that? Let's do it. Let's try it out. Let's heart. see. I'm going to give her five. I'm going to give her five. Okay. Okay. She Sandy, did great work. Who? Who else would you like to give some points with? You've got the most remaining. I'm going to give Luann. I'm going to give Luann 10. All right. I would also like to assign some points to Luann. I don't have as many remaining, but I will give her a five here. Sean, do you have any points that you want to assign Luann? Yeah, Luann definitely deserves some. Because like without Luann, Bethany doesn't get 10. Um, I would say Luann would be, I'll give her a six. All right. Um, okay. So we have eight points each remaining. I feel like Dorinda needs some points. I'm going to give totally. her another four points. Anyone else have some points they want to donate to the Dorinda cause? Absolutely. I would put i would double up four on dorinda um she has like a really good disappointed mom energy throughout here that uh is a real tearjerker for me (laughs) absolutely and she's made this eerie haunted house that is the setting for this whole thing um and she keeps it up with her own ghostly haunting energy so i'll give her five 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 and we get i made it nice like that's an iconic that's iconic yeah. yeah. So I'm wearing like the drunk drawn drugs. hoodie. Oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. So we have a total of 11 points remaining here. Uh, Sean, who else would you like to sprinkle some points on? Um, I would do two on Sonia. I think Sonia was like, even if it's mostly comedic relief, very, very welcome in this whole arc. Okay, yeah, I I'll give Sonia one of my remaining points here. Sandy, do you uh, have any that you want to give her? Or yeah, I'm gonna, gonna give her all her? my remaining points. Oh wow! Okay, I think Sonia not... did great. No, I love Sonia, and she was she was wronged, and she still gave us amazing <laughs> content. Okay, um, I've got the most remaining. I've got three remaining, and I want to give two of them to Carol. Uh, Sean, would you like to put any of your points on on Carol? Mm, no, I think I would put both of my remaining ones on Ramona. 
The Grimoda is oh. a pretty good facilitator throughout this one. And oh, okay. there is a, I don't think I brought it up, but there's a moment in the first of the three episodes where Ramona's ploy to make everything seem cool with Dorinda is to really aggressively offer caviar. Um, that really tickled <laughs> me. Uh, I love how much caviar Ramona like scooped onto her plate as well. Like it <laughs> yeah. was a, an unreasonable amount and I can only identify like what a, a reasonable amount of caviar is from watching these shows, but it was like, it was a mountain. <laughs> And were then they there was that them on little pancakes. Yeah. What were those? Yeah, they didn't look very yeah. good. Like they looked like they would ruin <laughs> the cab. Like maybe they'd be good, like in another context. But then there was that moment where someone called someone else out for like licking it off a used pancake, and then was like, "All I did was this." And then she, the whole pancake crumbled. <laughs> <laughs> if I had watched that episode, I would give her points for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I. I feel like there's maybe like this experimental culture surrounding caviar in New York, just because this most recent season of New York, we got to see like the caviar queen or whatever that weird business yeah. was. She came, was that the yeah, lingerie she, one? Yeah, it was during the lingerie episode where she came and uh, served caviar on Pringles. So just <laughs> maybe Some they're just trying new things. stuff. <laughs> I would like to give my last point to Ramona. Um, that brings our totals right now. And we'll have a chance to like reallocate. You can make one move to reallocate some points. Um, that puts Bethany at 25 points, Luann at 21 points, Dorinda at 13 points, Sonia at six points, and Carol at two points. Sean, would you like to move any of your points? Yeah, I'm gonna move. Hmm, I'm gonna move one point off of Bethany to Jules purely for being so Asian and bringing board games. <laughs> okay, and um, I I'm kind of happy with where my points are. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna move three points off of Bethany and I would like to reallocate one to Carol one and two to Ramona uh, Sandy how about yourself so now if you can't see the board we've got Luann and Bethany at 21 points each we have next Dorinda at 13 points then we have Sonia at six Ramona at five Carol at three and Jules at one. I am good now that you guys made the right choice and made Luann and Bethany equal. I don't have to move any of my points. If I were to, mm. I would move them to Sonia, but there's not really anything I can take away from anyone else. So I'll leave them as is. Okay. Yeah. I, I am pretty happy with how this, how this shook out. I think that this seems like a reasonable rating here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe mm -hmm. Carol is a little underrated in my opinion. I feel like, you know, we got her throwing a fit about the, the pedophile stuff and mm -hmm. we got the iconic text message with, I'm sorry, I called you a pedophile. But that's a lot at, you know, that's, that's more Luann and Ramona. So yeah, I'm, I'm not mad about this overall rating. I like it. Was Carol the one who clocked that only very rich people put uh, wallpaper in the closets? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a mark of so, wealth. Yeah. Yeah. Big I, ups uh, for that. I appreciated that. <laughs> mm. Awesome. Well, that concludes our um, Real Housewives Berkshire's Christmas special. Do you guys have anything you want to go back and touch on before we close things out here? Oh, how much do you think the Santa cost? Uh, like the one, the, the live one that she brings in to like spread Christmas cheer. Did Dorinda say that that was her sister? Yeah. Oh, so okay. Hopefully not a lot. <laughs> 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 Maybe her sister is a professional Santa. Uh, yeah, could I was be. hoping it was like someone from the neighborhood that they hired to bring <laughs> it. <laughs> um, Sandy, how about you? Do you have anything you want to go back on? No, but it was a it was a real pleasure. This is a holiday classic, and I was so glad to delve back into that world. 
Yeah, totally. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to be taking a break until the new year, but we'll be back um, after after the new year. So um, do you guys want to let everyone know where they can find you? We'll start with you, Sean. Uh, oh, I can't be found. Just <laughs> I just want to plug a holiday cheer and spirit. All right. Uh, Sandy, how about yourself? I am at Corporeal Curios on Instagram if you want to see some weird hair art and my adventures in making Christmas puddings. Oh, nice. (laughs) Um, Well, that's been Bravo Outsider. I'm your host, Craig Midwinter. You can find me on LinkedIn, I guess. Mostly just follow our socials on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. We're at Bravo Outsider. Subscribe to us on YouTube. That's the big one that we're working on right now. So go and check that out um, and leave us a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. Until next week, keep on wifing. <laughs>